Okay, looks like we're live. All right, welcome everybody to the Passive Income Show. I'm Dave Espino, joined by my co-host Phil Ebener, and we're excited today to talk about online courses, the whole world of online courses, everything having to do with creating, promoting, publishing uh, online courses. And we're gonna just talk a little bit about the, the state of the union, the state of the uh, art and science of online courses today. Uh, it's been a while since we did one of these, so we're, uh, I'm speaking for myself, I'm a little rusty. But uh, <laughs> Phil, he's always doing this stuff, so I'm sure he's gonna be great, so. Uh, <laughs> No it pressure, Phil. I'm, just re I'm relying on you to carry the whole show, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, it has been a little while since we've done one, uh, but <laughs> I've also been paying attention to the things that you're doing sort of along with or outside of teaching just online courses, and I'm, I'm really excited to chat with you about those things too. So uh, welcome everyone who's watching. We got 12 people who are watching on the All YouTube right. page. So if you can just chat, let us know who is watching, chat in the comments, say, where you're coming from, who you are, so that we can see who is actually here live with us. We're super excited to have you joining us now. And if you have any questions throughout the show, just throw them at us and we'll answer your questions. All right, so I should have YouTube open at the same time so I could see that. Yeah, that's how we can see the uh, comments. All right. And I think there's a little bit of a delay for us getting the comments, but... Mm -hmm. and... Oh, cool, awesome. Oh, nice. We got John, Alex, we got Rod from the Freedom Network. Jason Gandy is here. Awesome. Thanks awesome for your courses. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, guys. Welcome, everybody. Oh, Dave, what's up? How's it? How have you been? You you have moved, right? Since the last <laughs> time we talked. <laughs> yeah, I moved as part of the Witness Protection Program. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. uh, my family and I moved to Idaho. And uh, we love it here. I mean, it's been amazing. Uh, weather's kind of hot. I got I to gotta give you that. But uh, it's beautiful out here, a lot of nature. Uh, even around where we live, around our house, there's squirrels and geese and ducks and cows and stuff like that. But it's not, it's not like in the middle of the boonies when somebody says, oh, you moved to Idaho. There must be like nothing there. Now, there's like this beautiful uh, shopping center called The Village that's real high end. And there's just about any amenity you could imagine, uh, any kind of restaurant, any kind of anything really that you need. Nice. Uh, the the city downtown Boise is like ten minutes away. Mm -hmm. uh, traffic is minimal compared to you know compared to living in the LA area. And so and and the main thing I think that I've noticed about here is people are so super nice. I mean, um, you know, they're now I understand what they say when they say uh, a slower pace. It mm -hmm. seems like there's less for people to be worried about, less congestion, less traffic, less crime. So it kind of tends to make you less less stress, basically. Um, wow. So it's it's been awesome. Um, it's been great. That that does sound awesome. And I know there's a few fellow entrepreneurs out there in the Boise area. Have you been able to meet up with anybody that you've met online? Yeah, actually, I met with Dennis Smith, and uh, there's a possibility we might get an office. Uh, together. Mm -hmm. Another friend of mine who's been in the internet marketing space for a long time has this office that we might share and he has like he has it all fully set up for video. Nice. I mean he's got the lighting, the green screen, the blue screen, the backdrops, a couch, a whiteboard, stools. I, he probably has cameras too although I'd, I'd use my own but I mean it's all set up. So it's like it's not just renting an office it's having an office plus a studio space to be able to just do as much video as I want. So yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah. I was just uh, interviewing this guy for the Online Course Masters podcast, and he was recording from his garage studio, and he just had it all set up. He he teaches art classes, so he didn't only have like a talking head setup, but he had his setup for when he's recording him drawing, and everything was already already all set up. He he had yeah. like a podcasting setup and a live like a talking head setup and wow. the other setup so it's just like man that makes it so easy to create a bunch of content <laughs> yeah i mean this this office is perfect because it's it's all set up plus a regular office like and for a lot less money than i would have to pay for just just an office and then set myself up you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it's it's turnkey and i i love that so i'm gonna finalize that pretty soon and i'm gonna be creating a lot more video <laughs> nice nice 
Yeah. Well, things have been going over here. Good over here. It, it's it's hot over here too. Uh, how hot is it in Boise? Uh, today it's probably about ninety three. Okay, yeah, it's like the it's been like. Well, I'm in San Dimas now, and it's ho- about ten degrees hotter yeah. in San Dimas versus Fullerton, La Mirada area. That's true. Anyway, so it's upper nineties, even into the hundreds. The past few weeks, it's been really hot lately here too. San Dimas is really hot. I used to teach there. I used to teach uh, insurance classes at oh, an yeah, office in San Dimas. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm real yeah. familiar with that. Nice. So um, <laughs> I don't I don't know if we want to just jump right into it. It's what I want to talk about. But I want you to kind of explain this whole steam it thing to me oh, and sure. people listening. Yeah, well, uh, I got turned on to steam it about a little over a year ago or about a year ago. Um, I follow this this one guy who always puts out the most cutting edge, latest, greatest, coolest stuff, you know, about internet marketing. And he said, here's a website that'll pay you to post content. And if you liken it to Facebook, you know, Facebook, they make money on our content, basically. You know, they make money on the fact that we all congregate there. We're all kind of keeping tabs on each other. It's a social networking thing. And they get to run ads to that huge population of almost 2 billion people, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, imagine if Facebook, instead of having that business model, they said, uh, we're going to take all that money that we would make on ads and we're going to just share it out out to all the people who post. We're going to reward the people who post the best value content or the the best quality content with more and the people who post content that isn't that great with less. Mm -hmm. Or here's another scenario. If you're familiar with Reddit, you know, Reddit has upvotes and downvotes and that kind of thing. And so your your reputation kind of rises and falls with how good your content is. If you put some kind of spammy content, they'll downvote you, you know, to smithereens. Mm -hmm. But if you post something that's really useful for that community, they'll upvote you. And if and if you do really well, then you might make it to the front page of Reddit, which is where all the eyeballs are. Right. Yeah. So. Steam it is kind of like a Reddit, but where you get paid. So if you post quality content and it gets upvoted, each one of those upvotes has a value to it based on the person doing the upvoting. Mm -hmm. If the person doing the upvoting has a really high uh, credibility and clout on the site and they've accumulated what we call steam power, then their upvote counts for a lot more. And so uh, the other day I got, uh, it was just a comment that I made on somebody's post Mm -hmm. and I got $7 and something cents for that comment. And the $7 and something cents was actually in uh, US dollars, but steam at that, at that point was worth about a dollar 50 per dollar. Mm -hmm. So that seven bucks uh, was, I don't know, it was worth maybe like 10 bucks to me or something like that uh, when it's all said and done. And so, the where people kind of where I kind of like was wondering, wait a minute, are they just kind of creating money out of thin air? Where does this money come from? Right. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm like. <laughs> where's that seven bucks coming from that this this person upvoted? Well, as it turns out, everybody gets uh, paid in steam, which is a cryptocurrency that in effect, yeah, cryptocurrency can be just kind of, you know, you could make one, mm-hmm. you could create a cryptocurrency and then at that point, it becomes, what does party A believe party B's cryptocurrency is worth? Mm-hmm. You know, if you think about the, the money that we have in our pockets, the, the $100 bill, the $50 bill, the $10 bill, whatever, that's all based on trust, right? right. We're trusting that the federal government is going to make good on that $10 bill, that $20 bill, or, or really when it all boils down to it, if you really look at it macro macroeconomically, that money doesn't doesn't really exist. Yeah, just numbers. I mean, I think about that all the time when I'm at the store right. and I'm like, oh, well, I just put my credit card in here and there's just numbers that went from here to there. But yeah, that's know, all, like, that's all getting, it really is. Even getting paid from you to me every month, it's just like these numbers that appear in our PayPal account and it just gets transferred. And then I pay down my mortgage, which is just another number. <laughs> and it's just crazy. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And the thing about it is, you know, our country has such a huge deficit that it would almost be impossible to to 
pay that debt down, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're really dealing with dollars equal trust. I trust this is worth $20. I'm giving it to somebody else who also trusts that it's worth $20 mm -hmm. and they take it as value, you know? So that's the bottom line with cryptocurrency is assuming that the, the underlying foundation of it is good, then this is what we're being paid in. But here's the cool thing. If you get paid in steam, if you want to, you could immediately turn that into dollars. And is and that something it. that you've already done so far? Yeah, I haven't I haven't turned it into dollars. I've turned it into other cryptos like Bitcoin and mm -hmm. Ethereum, mm -hmm. which are the two big ones that that kind they're kind of the standard bearers. You yeah. know, Bitcoin, of course, everybody's heard of. And then Ethereum is right next to it in terms of uh, uh, people knowing about it. It's not right next to it in terms of value. Like right now, Bitcoin is at about twenty three hundred dollars per coin. Mm -hmm. um, and you can buy fractions of it. So, I mean, if you if you had 20 bucks, you could buy $20 worth of Bitcoin, for example. Right. Uh, Ethereum is, is at roughly uh, $200 per coin. So, um, so the but it wasn't that long ago that Bitcoin was at 600 bucks. Yeah, that's I've been hearing about it on the news lately. Well, I've got a couple questions about this to clarify for myself, but I just want to sure. again welcome people. We got 19 people watching live, which is awesome. I guess you guys All have right. missed, missed us a little bit, so that's good to to see you here and we've got some questions rolling in, so we're going to get to those in just a minute including uh one from Powell for, who's coming all the way from Ireland, so thanks for listening, <clears throat> Powell. And then Yogesh awesome. ju just asked a question about general passive income. So we'll get to those in just a minute, but two questions. One, uh, for the content that you're putting on Steemit, what I know is that you can just put like a YouTube video, right? You don't have to just, sure. you don't upload it directly to Steemit, but can it also be on like your blog? Can you just repurpose content? Yeah, I think that's one of the best ways to do it is just repurpose content that you're already creating. If you're if you're promoting online courses or if you are trying to build a following in your niche topic, just create content around that. Mm -hmm. You know, you might create a video like I do a daily video uh, yep. every day, um, all about online marketing, digital marketing, teaching online, all this kind of stuff, right? And I just, all I do is I post the video on Steemit with a blurb that kind of describes the, the video, mm -hmm. the same blurb that I already put on YouTube for that video, the description. I just do, repost it. And, and by doing that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, by doing that, I'll get paid anywhere from, you know, like 40 cents, $1.60, $3, $5. The most I've ever gotten paid was 46 bucks for one post. And, and by the way, that's really low compared to what some people get. Mm -hmm. um, but it, what what it what it amounts to is you developing a following, and every once in a while, one of those people that follows you will be what we call a whale, which is somebody who has really high clout on the site. And whenever they upvote something, you know, it kicks you into another level. Yeah. Um, and so as, as you develop the content that that people want to read or see, or even a photo that you post and a little story about your photo. Um, you get, you get paid. And even if it's a little bit, it's a heck of a lot more than YouTube pays. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, I, for, for me, I see no reason why not to do this with content that I'm already creating. And since I have content, old content, I might just, you know, post it on, on steam it. Uh, it sounds like the sign up process is a little bit harder. How do you get an account and get going with it? Uh, well, it's been a while since I did mine, but it, you basically just fill out the, pay, the fill out the account and you get a password. And that's the most important thing. It's a randomly generated password by Steemit to you because part of this has to do with the fact that they're paying you in cryptocurrency. And so you've got to have this key. And so as, as long as what you do is you copy and paste that into several places so you don't ever lose it because they don't guarantee that they can recover that, that key for mm. you. Um, and then it's usually about a one or two or three day wait for them to approve it, depending on how much, uh, how many people are flooding the site to, to join. Yeah. Um, and that's about it. It's really not, not difficult. You just fill out the, the application to get on. So um, I'm still confused about the money pop part of it. And it's partly because I just don't know that much about cryptocurrencies, but so they have the crypt, their currency, which is steam. 
again, so where is this coming from? <laughs> <laughs> how how are they making money themselves to be able to pay people who are commenting and posting on Steemit? All right, that's a great question. So let's let's think of it as Bitcoin because you know we, we're more familiar with that term Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin exists as a digital currency that they only made a finite number of Bitcoin. I think it was 21 million yeah, Bitcoin that okay. they made. And they're never going to make any more than that. And that's it. Uh, Steam is the same kind of thing where they make a finite amount and they're not going to make any more of it. And so okay. it has the ability to rise in value based on the fact that there's a certain amount of supply and it's not going to grow. A uh, little different than the U.S. dollar, where they can just keep printing more money, right? If they if they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in Bitcoin, the way Bitcoin is made is typically it's it's mined. You mine it through using a, a very heavy duty computer system, and the mining is basically uh, answering mathem mathematical questions. Uh, that well, let me start. Let me start afresh here. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm doing my best because I'm I'm fairly new at it too. Okay. Yeah, no, but it's good. Bitcoin and Steam both exist on something called a blockchain. A blockchain is a basically think of it as a ledger of every transaction that's ever done with regard to Bitcoin or with regard to Steam. So any transaction that's ever been done with Bitcoin or will be done is on this blockchain. So think I think of blockchain as Lego bricks. Mm -hmm. One Lego brick has to be like completed and several several uh, miners, these are machines that are doing this calculation, are making sure that that ledger of that, that one block of transactions is all accurate and complete and kind of you know locked in place, right? Mm -hmm. Then the next block starts in that blockchain and all those transactions happen. And at a certain point when it fills up the block, all the the miners, the people who are, are legitimizing all these transactions, or just making sure that everything's accurate, mm -hmm. they seal that off. There might be twenty or thirty or fifty uh, miners who are doing this to make sure that there's redundancy and make sure everything's accurate. And, and so are these and are these transactions just like Bob sent Bill twenty bit twenty do U.S. dollars of yeah. Bitcoin? And exactly. making sure that that twenty dollars was actually twenty dollars sent. Yep, exactly. Okay. But that's, sometimes that's really it might be it more is. complex, I guess. But yeah, and so those miners get paid for their what they're doing, and they get paid in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Or in, now in Steam, instead of miners, uh, we're mining by posting content. So the value that we're providing, instead of the value over here of figuring out mathematical calculations, the value we're providing on Steam is posting quality content. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm sure there are miners there too, or some way that they you know, verify all the transactions and all that, but mm -hmm. it adds another level because the blockchain is what all these different things can operate on. Like you could have an app that runs on a blockchain. That's basically what Steam it is. It's an app. It's it's really one of the first that could go uh, mainstream or could go really big because everybody understands a social network, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool because it's not just, hey, I'm going to invest in Steam. It's I'm going to create this crypto for myself by posting content. Mm. Um, it's it's tricky, man. It, it's, it takes a while to understand. Like, I, that's why I... Um, I went search. I was reading a lot of these articles on Steemit, uh -huh. on the platform itself about Steemit, and I was like, "Wow, what? Wait, what is this Steam Power stuff? And what is Steam backed dollars and Steam? There's three different things, right?" And I couldn't understand it all. I couldn't put it all together until I got a Udemy course <laughs> by somebody who knew what it all was, and he walked me through it. And I was like, "Wow, you know, this is awesome." <laughs> For once, well, yeah. I was a student, you know, and I was like, this is so cool because you could read. It's so interesting because I got to see it from the standpoint of a student, right, Phil? Mm -hmm. uh, we're, so, we're so into creating content, mm -hmm. so into teaching. But, man, when you look at Udemy as a student, I was really inquisitive. I really wanted to know what the heck is, how does this all work, right? Yeah. And this guy took me by the hand, you know, through the computer and showed me, okay, this is Steam. This is what you do with it. 
This is how you can power up. This is how you power down. All these different terminologies I'd heard, but had no idea what they were. And then it all kind of coalesced in that course. <laughs> Okay, well, cool. I, th I think I'm gonna have to take that course. I mean, it's making a lot of more sense. So I think thank you for explaining it. And it um, yeah, it still is like, it's so out of the norm from yeah. what we're used to, which is why yeah. it's so confusing. But, um, but, but here's what I would recommend here. What I I'd recommend what I did. What I did was I said, great, steam pays me to post. Awesome. I'm gonna start posting. Yeah, And then just start posting and just go on there and just see you'll get little rewards, 20 cents, 50 cents. Remember, if it's a dollar reward that you get on an upvote, it's worth about a dollar 20 or dollar 50 or whatever. Uh, and just start posting, just get familiar with it. And as you go, you'll learn about it. But if you really want to learn how it works, then then check out that course. I have I'll put a I have a link to it that I can put on here in the chat. Cool. Awesome. Uh, we had one question that I'll just throw out really quickly from Thomas George. What's up, Thomas, about Steemit? And that's why I'm going to get to it. He's asking about if you post more than once a day you know, and if you know if that's a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, it's totally OK to um, to post more than once a day. Um, did it not show that? Um, do you post on the uh, YouTube? Yeah page don't see it yet I'll Let's see if that worked okay so it's totally okay to, to post more than once a day I, I think I read somewhere that you could post up to 30 times a day mm -hmm. um, so there's you know, it's far more than you could probably humanly post if you wanted to yeah um, the main thing is to make sure that your posts are quality so that as people see your quality they follow you and then that's how you build your your following on there got it and is there any particular type of content you've seen that does better like video versus articles written content well you know it's interesting i i, I see this one lady who is this one younger pretty girl who is always posting about her travels uh, i travel to the cayman islands and she's got these beautiful like super high quality photos I don't know if she's taking the photos or what, but um, and she just tells her story and she gets these payouts, 100, 200, 300 dollars per post. And I'm like, wow, what the heck? Now I'm thinking either she came to Steemit with a good following or she built a following on Steemit, uh, one way or the other. And uh, you get enough of those people that are higher up in the Steemit echelons voting on your stuff and you, you can make some good money. When I was first introduced to Steemit, uh, one of the big news items was somebody made $15,000 on one post. Mm. <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah, it was it was because at that at that moment Steemit had just opened the doors and had just started paying out um, in Steam. Uh, they had been in beta and they'd op opened it up for about 3 or 4 months and then finally they just kind of opened the floodgates. So all this pent up uh, <laughs> out steam power that people had got put into votes and people made some really good money that way. Yeah. But, um, what I think, here's what I think. I think that there's, we're in a period where, you know, we, we might get a few bucks here and there for, for posts, but as more and more mainstream people come in or more and more people start to find, find out about Steemit, it's going to grow and the value of, of the posts are going to grow. And then there will be a big separation between quality, good quality and poor quality content and the great, great quality content people will have a good reputation and build from that level. So yeah, I mean, kind of like any platform like YouTube yeah. or Udemy or or anything, the the cream of the crop is always going to kind of separate itself. So there was a yeah. que another question from Thomas who's talking about asking about just putting all his YouTube videos on Steemit over the next few weeks. I think I have no clue and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think personally, I would rather kind of spread it out over time and Maybe yeah. one if you have one one video per day, that might be a good idea. But yeah. I wouldn't be posting, you know, 20, 30 videos every day for the next couple of weeks and use up all your sort of leverage and all your content. Yeah. You know, you'd want to sort of spread it out over time so you can build up that reputation on yeah, Steam. I, I agree. I think that's a good idea. Just take your time, post maybe one a day, 
and build following. You know, uh, mm -hmm. whenever people follow one of your, uh, whenever people follow you, follow them back. Whenever people comment on your posts, uh, follow them back, uh, mm -hmm. and start to build. Uh, what a lot of people do is they they follow a lot of the higher rollers, and then uh, a percentage of those people follow you back automatically, and and that's how you build your following over time. Got it. And does the value of a post ever go down or does it always just kind of increase over time if it gets more traction? Yeah, what happens is a post, you get paid within 24 hours on a post. Mm -hmm. So it's not an ongoing income that each post makes you. It's just mm -hmm. a one time and it's resolved. Something something like, uh, I don't, I don't want to give you any details that I'm not 100% sure of, but mm -hmm. pretty much the value of that post will be resolved within 24 hours. Now, when when you are looking at it afterwards, you'll see it go up and down because the price of steam is going up and down, but the the actual payout will be done, will be locked in within 24 hours. Got it. Okay, that makes a lot more sense to me too because I'm seeing, you know, it looks like the homepage of Reddit and you see these like maybe posts from a few days ago that are worth a certain amount. Um, I'm wondering if it ever goes down and then like you end up losing money or owing money or something like that. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that won't work. I mean, that won't happen that way. Yeah, it'll yeah. just get resolved in 24 hours and then that's in your account. And then like what, like I said, what I did was I bought Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so I, I put, uh, I ended up being something like 1800 bucks that I've made on Steam it so far. Um, and then recently, and this is gonna get a little technical, but but Bitcoin was going down and Steam it was going down. There was a recent, downtrend so but steam it was going down at a slower rate than bitcoin was so i cashed out bitcoin put it into steam because i i really believe in this platform for the long term mm -hmm. and so the more of that steam power i have in my account the more when somebody upvotes my stuff the more i get and when i up upvote somebody the more they get mm -hmm. so really I'm, I'm on my way to being one of those whales at, at least i'll be a, a dolphin at first then I'll go for being a whale. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some incentive to leaving your money in Steam. Yeah, uh, when you leave your money in in your actual Steam account, you get something like a two percent uh, interest rate on that money, hmm. and it's it's kind of like having equity in the Steam platform as well. Yeah. So cool. for those who want the longer term benefit, there is a long term benefit, and those who want the short term, just cash out and buy something. You can do that too. Interesting. So I want to get to some of our other questions, but sure. uh, since we're just on this topic, there's one more question from Ruth Ann that just <laughs> popped up about if you know the demogra the average demographic age of people on Steemit right now. Oh, that's a great question. I don't. Uh, I have no clue. Yeah. yeah. If you go on there, if you go to steemit.com, you'll see all the categories on the right side and you could kind of get a sense from that. But uh, Right now, I think it's a lot of early adopters. I think it's a lot of people who are already involved in cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. and they've heard that this site pays in crypto, and so they're they're you know playing around with it, testing it, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of Grant Cardone. He's a pretty kind of well known guru, but I saw him on there recently hmm. uh, posting. So uh, people are starting to discover it, and as those people discover it, it's just going to build a new way to make an income by doing stuff you already do. You know. Yeah. I've been playing around with just, I took a few photos off my camera, you know, like some pictures I thought were cool, posted them and told my story. I got a dollar something for those and, you know, which again is a dollar fifty two bucks and it all adds up over time. So, I mean, you could just like, you could just play at it is what I'm trying to say, you know, just yeah. do something, post something. It's not going to bite you. you know? And at the end of the day, it's just another platform where you can start to be recognized and people might end up following you, being interested in you, finding you on YouTube or on your own website. And they might be interested in another product or course or anything that you have to offer. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned my courses on there. Uh, sometimes I'll promote affiliate products on there. So not only are you, uh, I mean, in effect, you're getting paid to promote an affiliate product. You know, like you're getting paid for the post and then you're getting paid when people buy the affiliate product. Yeah. So there's all kinds of ways you can do it. Man, this is interesting. After this, I'm going to go and sign up for my account. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Cool. Well, we had a couple questions. One, um, I'll give my opinion on and then I'll let you answer. But Powell asked early on, 
Uh, what would we advise on someone who wants to create their first course but doesn't know what niche to pursue? What do you choose if you are a jack of all trades? That's a great question. And I, I have a few different answers. Hopefully you'll kind of pick one that <laughs> suits you best. But I think um, if you don't have an online course, what I've always said and Dave knows is that just pick something you're most passionate about and create a course on it so that you can figure out if it's something that you even like creating the course content, uh, making the videos, editing the videos, putting it up on platforms. If you're passionate about it, you're going to teach it better. People are going to like that better. You're going to be more authentic. And I think that's something that students like is when you're authentic about something. So if you know about something that is trending or is a hot topic, it might not be the best idea to teach that as your first class, uh, just because you might not be great at teaching online yet. So teach, picking something you're passionate is great. There's ways that you can, if you're just a jack of all trades and you, you're passionate about a lot of things and you wanna pick the one that might make the most money, uh, there's ways to sort of validate and the easiest right now anyways is going on, on Udemy and using the insights feature. You have to be an instructor to get access to the Udemy insights feature, uh, but uh, and for people who are listening, let me know if uh, any of you don't know what the insights feature is and we can kind of walk through it or explain it a little bit more. But once you have access to that, you can search topics and it gives you a rough idea on how many courses are on this topic, if it, how much money people are making from this topic, if there's an opportunity, meaning if there's a lot of interest versus not as many courses in that topic. So that tool is something that for new instructors, it's great because you can find kind of topics that still need to be taught. Um, there's the other ideas of just searching and seeing if a topic is valid, like seeing if there's a lot of YouTube content, Amazon Kindle books on a topic. But um, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a fan of just picking what you're most passionate about. And I say that though, with one caveat, and that's think about what you might be passionate about in the long run and what you can build a bigger business off of. And it, things might change, but I would rather ha have you pick a topic that you can see creating more content around, creating a website around, creating a YouTube channel around, coaching around, doing coaching for this topic. Uh, so that kind of looking out into the future and seeing that as a possibility is also a good thing. Dave, any thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, it was such a great answer. I really can't add too much to it. Uh, that's I, I totally second what Phil just said. Um, and the only thing I would say is don't be afraid to put your first course up. Uh, if, if you have to make it a short course, like a 30, 40 minute course, uh, just just I would say focus more on getting a course published than you do on what topic it is or how perfect it is. Because we often stifle ourselves by thinking, man, it has, we have this vision in our head of like the most, the most perfect, incredible, heavenly course in the world that we have to make. And it doesn't have to be like that. You can just get your, get your course up there and learn from that experience. Think of your first course as a learning experience or as your training wheels for when you really go for it. I'm not saying, you know, skimp and don't do well on it, but I'm saying focus more on the fact that you want to complete your first course and get it up. See, there's, in business, there's a lot to be said for momentum. And the, the key, I think, is getting your momentum going, getting yourself moving forward instead of uh, s slowing yourself down by too many, you know, nitpicky, perfectionistic ideas. So mm -hmm. that would be the only thing I would add to, to Phil's um, awesome answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, cool. Hopefully that answers your question, Paul. If you guys have any questions, uh, <clears throat> please post them in the comments. We will ask them or any questions or just topics you want us to, to talk about. There was another question about moving people. Um, the Freedom Network asks uh, us to chat about transitioning students from Udemy and Skillshare into a group coaching program. Um, I can talk a little bit about, you know, we have the rules about how you can get someone from Udemy into your sort of website or into your own um, atmosphere there you have the bonus lecture i think the best way to get someone off of udemy or skillshare 
into your world is through free educational content and putting mm -hmm. out great free videos on YouTube that are educational, putting out, writing great articles and using that as supplemental content that you send to your students through educational announcements and not as a way, not as a direct way to get people on your email list or get someone into your coaching program, but just to get them aware of your other uh, places that you are outside of Udemy. Because at the yep. end of the day, people are going to join your coaching program if they are your fan, if they are, if they love you, if they love, every, not just because they took a Udemy course of yours. I think there might be very few people who like take a Udemy course and are like, oh, well, I wish this guy had a coaching program. I think it's the people right. that take, find you on Udemy perhaps, and then they realize that you have this great website with all this cool content. You're doing social media. They follow you on social media. You're doing YouTube videos and you're managing a Facebook group or something like that. And then they eat up more of your content and then they're like, wow, I really want more. How can I take it to the next level? So for me, it's about transitioning people to my being my fan outside of Udemy through just like free, great free content first. Yeah, I agree. I think it and think of it, you have to think of it in more of a long term uh, angle than short term, uh, because if you're doing that, if you're doing what Phil just said, you're sending people to your blog and on the blog, maybe there's a little opt in on the side or you're sending people to YouTube. Again, all this has to be purely educational content, right? <clears throat> Can't be promotional in any way, uh, but you're sending people to your YouTube channel and they're subscribing there. Over time, they get to know you, they get to like you, they get to trust you so that when you do put out a coaching program, you know, they're primed for you. But I would, along with that, if you're going to have a coaching program, I would definitely recommend that you have a separate sales funnel just for the coaching program and not rely on trying to hopefully get a few people from Udemy or from Skillshare uh, because that's really a very long-term and very kind of nebulous play, right? It, there's no way to, to even track in most cases whether they came from Udemy. But if you set up a dedicated sales funnel for your coaching program, again, that you're not gonna promote to Udemy or Skillshare, you're gonna promote this outside of that, then you're gonna have a lot more trackable results and you're gonna have uh, faster results because it'll be dedicated to that process. So I would do both though. I mean, it doesn't hurt to do both, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes it's just off having it as an option on your website. I mean, Thomas George just asked uh, about for, for me and my training on t online courses, what the best option is having a paid one-on-one -on -one call or joining my premium course now that I have. And I don't have that option as just like on my website. Hey, if you want to do coaching with me, here's my hourly rate. Just because I haven't set it up yet. I have the premium course, which includes some Skype time. Uh, but sometimes it's just making sure you have that as an option because you never know if someone's going to come to your site and, and want to talk, talk with you. Um, to answer Thomas's question, I think I have done some just one-on-one -on -one coaching in the past. I've and I I can do that for for people, but I do like bundling it with the the program, um, just because I feel like there's a lot of other great resources there, and it kind of walks you through the process uh, yourself. Um, and that's been interesting for me to get that program up and running. I've learned a lot about just webinars, premium products, and like I see you, you've been posting a few times in the passive income show group, you know, you get those emails that are, are four or $500 or $400. And it just feels so good, not just to make the money, but to see people trusting you and finding value in your content that they would pay you for that. Um, not that the Udemy sales aren't great anymore. I love all of them, but it takes way more of those to, to get, you know, that same value from, from people and even to give it that amount of value too. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, that it's, that brings up an interesting point that I've been thinking about last couple of weeks. And that is how we can fall prey to just rely on Udemy as the end all be all. And as instructors, you know, because Udemy makes it easy, right? We publish our courses there and they go to work marketing. 
and they do a great job of that. And so, but especially for beginning instructors who don't know the world outside of Udemy, I would encourage them to also be thinking about self-hosting at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's a world of benefit to that besides the fact that, um, you know, you're making, let's, let's call Udemy your base income, right? Whatever money comes in from Udemy. But if you have a self-hosted online course platform, uh, there are new companies sprouting out, sprouting up uh, that are wanting our content. They're wanting to build their course platforms and that kind of thing. And so you want to be able to point them to a self-hosted platform. You want to be able to point any clients that you create yourself to your self-hosted platform. Like if you're doing a YouTube channel and you mention one of your courses, I would send them to my own self-hosted platform versus the Udemy platform for a number of reasons, which we don't have time to get into here. But financially speaking, it makes more sense. And then as these other online learning platforms sprout up, you know, and they're continuing to pursue us instructors, you have a way to point them to your content, to show them, and then uh, always put your courses on Dropbox so you could just send them the Dropbox link so they can upload those courses for you. Uh, let's yeah. talk a little bit about that, Phil, because I've been approached recently by a couple of companies, and I know that you're, you've always got your finger on the pulse of these other companies that are online learning platforms where we can just take the same courses mm -hmm. and put them on all these other platforms and increase our income that way. You know, the only new one that I've become aware of and have, am interested in is learningly.com. It's like yep. learning.ly. Um, I was approached by them and I heard about them and, or I saw that another instructor that I know is on there. So I reached out to that guy and asked if he was actually making money from it, which I always do with these platforms now. And he said, yeah. And he said not that much, but even not that much to him was like, well, I've got a lot of courses that I could put on that platform. And even if it's a hundred extra bucks a month, that's a hundred, a thousand, more than a thousand dollars at the end of the year. So for me, it's, it's usually worth it in that sense. They pay every quarter, I believe. And so I haven't been paid yet. I just launched my courses on there literally the past couple of weeks. So we'll see, but they have, they're backed by the economist group, which is a pretty large company. They've got a nice, a big, a bunch of websites, uh, publications out there. So I like seeing that as, um, a backing. But um, aside from that, you know, the ones that are working for me still, aside from Udemy and Skillshare, are Stack Skills and Stack Social. Um, Stack, mm -hmm. they're the same umbrella, but Stack Skills started doing a lot of marketing the past month, I, I feel like, on selling their own courses on their own platform. So they had like a big sale like a couple weeks ago, like a one or two day massive sale. And I got a lot of sales from that. Um, hmm. that promotion they did. So getting your courses up there is uh, something I would do. Um, any other new ones that you've found? Uh, yeah, I was recently approached by Learningly also, and I just uploaded five courses uh, to them after my first, my initial course. So I have six now mm -hmm. up there, but um, I'm going to be pretty much posting all my courses to them uh, over the next few days or maybe weeks, depending on how long, how quick I can get it done. Yeah. Uh, Cyber U is another one. Uh, I know you've had some experience with them. They are still, in my opinion, they're still like, they're, they're kind of climbing up the hill. They're like, chugga, 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 chugga. You know, they're just, they're, they're going to get there, but they're, but you have to just kind of wait and be patient for them. Uh, they're backed by a really big company. Learningly is backed by The Economist, which is a great, you know, um, uh, magazine, mm -hmm. financial magazine, very, very well established. Um, I, I'm on another site called amazing.com, which they're kind of closed right now, but they're, they're mainly for e-commerce mm -hmm. uh, teachers and things like that. Uh, just got approached by a site called Professly. I don't know if you've heard of them. Hmm. Uh, kind of like Pro Professor Professly, hmm. something like that. I'm going to do a Skype call or, or a call with them in the next day or two yeah. to learn more about them. But here's, here's basically what you need to ask any company that approaches you if you're an online instructor. You need to ask them, well, here's what I ask them, okay? What, what is your marketing plan? How do you intend to you know, bring students along? 
Uh, do you have an email list? Do you have a, an existing audience base? Uh, you know, in the case of, for example, Learningly, they're tied to The Economist, which has a million member base. It doesn't mean they're going to use all those million members or approach all those million members, but they have something, right? Some kind of asset to, to go with. Uh, I asked them, you know, obviously you want to know the details of the payout, but that's kind of secondary to whether they can bring you students. Really wanting to know, can they bring you students? How established are they? How long have they been in business? These kinds of things. Because it could just be a waste of time to post your courses anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. Right. You want to you want to be sure that if you're going to invest the time, as minimal as that time is to get your courses on a, on a platform, that at least it's going to pay off for you, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but having said that, I, I, this is another thing I wanted to bring up in the show, Phil, is uh, do you know how easy it is and how, how great of a business it is for somebody who already has an audience? In other words, a company like The Economist. They're a good example, right? They already have an audience. They have an online presence. How easy it is and how profitable it is for a company like that to go, you know what, let's get into the online learning business. I mean, it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they really understand they're selling digits, they're selling online video and the cost of that online video is super cheap and they can set, they can, you know, hire a team to run it and all that kind of thing. So we're going to see a lot more companies like this come into play. Companies that go, let's get into that online learning business. Look, it's only going to cost us a team of this many people mm -hmm. for this much time and they can just run with it. I mean, it's going to happen. It's already happening little by little, right? But it's, I, I predict it's going to happen more and more. So when we create our courses, try to make them platform agnostic, meaning they don't relate to any platform. Don't say, hey, welcome to my Udemy course, you know, like I used to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to my Udemy course about how to sell on eBay, right? Yeah. Uh, so don't mention the platform that you're teaching on, right? Just make it generic in that sense. And that way you can upload that same course to all these different platforms as they come along and approach you. Same with, that's great advice. And same with how you brand your course. Um, it, it's a, I don't know, there's a debate on whether you should be branding it as your own brand with your logo. Mm -hmm. And I used to put my <clears throat> video school online logo in the bottom corner of all my videos, but there are some platforms that don't allow that. And so I've foregone that and I don't, put my branding on my courses and I realized that I and I kind of took what Seth Godin said at Udemy Live last year and he was talking about how it doesn't really matter where your your audience is it doesn't matter where your your brand is it's it's about you and what you create and I kind of took that and thought well if people are on my courses on Udemy and they really want to find out more information about me they're gonna look look up Phil Ebner, they're going to find me and they're going to become a fan some way or another. And, and maybe having that lo logo in there is, will help a little bit, but I, I, I think being at least exporting different versions, one with it and one without it. So that if you are uploading to a platform that disallows that it's a lot easier. Um, yeah. and it, I've even licensed some of my courses to, to people and they've asked to remove that logo and sometimes I don't have the, the original files unfortunately mm -hmm. anymore to do that so mm -hmm. yeah I'll get that advice. makes sense so so now you're now are you uh are you not branding or I'm not or branding doing... okay. yeah no I'm not branding any of my my videos with video school online I mean I'll mention it sometimes when it's relevant um to right. to just saying something but um but yeah, like Amazon yeah, video, uh, someone meant, uh, Max just asked about, or Thomas just asked about posting to Amazon Video Direct. And we actually have a course on posting to Amazon Video Direct. And I haven't, right. I actually added a few courses to Amazon Video Direct recently, but they were, you know, totally against having your logos and stuff like that in your videos. So um, I have still posted i'm still making you know 100 bucks or so a month on amazon video direct it's again one of those platforms like we don't know if it's gonna blow up if it's ever gonna grow or not but it's worth having our courses on there if it does right yeah, yeah it's it's funny think of it like investing so amazon video direct is kind of like a penny stock 
you dip your toe in it, you buy a little bit of it, you hope it goes up, you don't know if it will, it might not, and if it doesn't, at least you didn't invest a lot in it. But on the other hand, if it does pay off by them either expanding their, their Amazon video library or promoting special interest videos or whatever, you're there already, you know, you're one of the early ones. So that's, in general, I think it's the attitude we need to take on every platform and on everything that we do is do a quick, you know, return on investment analysis. Is it worth my time to do this? Mm -hmm. And then do it and be, be one of the early ones mm -hmm. and uh, put, you know, put your eggs in a lot of different little baskets is what I'm saying. Yeah. Instead of in one basket. Ramakant had a great question about hosting courses for free. If that's a good marketing <clears throat> strategy, although people don't turn up for paid courses. Um, I think I'm guessing you can uh, clarify if I'm not getting this straight, but I'm guessing you're talking about how on Udemy people pay and don't even end up showing up to your classes or partaking. I found that free courses are one of the best ways to build my email list and using Teachable and connecting it with ConvertKit, which is my email service provider. Um, they It's all automatic. So people who sign up for my free courses get on an email sequence. They get on my list. And so a free course is a great lead magnet to try to promote, especially on YouTube. I found a lot of people coming from YouTube to my free classes and uh, much better than sending them to like a free Udemy course because you can't promote to those people in your free Udemy course. Uh, although I still put I still put the free course on Udemy just as it as a way of getting students on Udemy and pe getting people aware of me on Udemy. But I definitely would recommend putting together some free courses just to help people get aware of you. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, uh, Phil, tell us about Skillshare. How how did it do uh, for you this most recent month? I know they've been kind of going through some changes and things with their, how much they pay out or how they pay out. Yeah, I you know I don't know if I'm just an anomaly or not, but and maybe it's just because I've been on there for a long time now and continue to put content there, but. Skillshare has been doing great. I mean, Skillshare could actually be a full-time income for me at this point. Um, wow. Last month was, every month has increased. Uh, I'm bringing up my stats so I can make sure, but every month this year has been better than the previous month. Not, wow. not just because of the minutes watched, but the payouts are um, increasing and the, the amount per minute that we're paid. So for the first few months of the year after they changed the pricing model, we were getting paid just around five cents a minute, I think it is that they're paying. But two months ago, we were paid six cents a minute. And then last month, it averaged about to six and a half cents a minute. So even though less people had listened, fewer people had watched my lessons, um, or at least I had fewer premium minutes watched last month, I was paid more. And it was actually my highest month ever on Skillshare. Um, so hmm. I'm continuing to put content on there just like the, I created a couple free courses uh, that I put on Udemy and on my own site back, uh, in June. And I put those on, on Skillshare, like why not? And so they, um, those kind of helped. Um, I'm not promoting really anything. I think the, the thing is that I'm teaching arty, creative, photo-related classes, and those do well on Skillshare. So if, you, if you're in those classes, that's if you're doing those classes, put them on Skillshare. I just did an interview with this guy who teaches Excel courses, and he's not doing good at all on, on Skillshare. So it's, it kind of depends on what topic you're into. But I wouldn't discount Skillshare. So Phil, Skillshare. do you think if, if I were to create a, like a ballet class for men over 50, you think that would be a good one? <laughs> On Skillshare. <laughs> well, I don't think they have any courses on that topic, so you might land have a gold mine right there. I didn't know that was one of your skills. <laughs> There's a lot of things people don't know about. <laughs> um, well, I think for comedy reasons, it might just be worth it for people to enroll in. That's for sure. <laughs> At least my family would enroll in it. I mean, I'd have that. Yeah, totally. Well. So in all serious note, the thing about Skillshare that I think has worked the past couple of months is that they, the first few months of the year, they had a ton of people enroll with their like free, like $1 for three months, or it was like free for three months promotion. 
And so they weren't making a lot of, as much money per like student. And now a lot mm -hmm. of those students, I guess, have transitioned and are now paying the full monthly price. Mm -hmm. And so the amount they're paying out per minute to all the instructors has increased. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's so, it's, okay. It's, like knowing what you know about my courses, would you think I should do that? Do you think I should post my courses on there? I've been, as you know, I've been saying for months that I was going to post them on Skillshare, but I've, I mean, we moved what, and I haven't had the time. I mean, for me, it's like, why not? Like, there's no reason right. not to just like, it's like, why not post your YouTube video to steam it? And keep your expectations right. low unless unless you like want to make Skillshare your thing, which I think you can do. And people people do that. They go all in with Skillshare. They they're really active on the platform. They they're really smart about creating courses that are based off of topic uh, off of projects, even if it's not necessarily an art class and they do relatively well. There's a lot of lifestyle courses that that do well and there's more and more mm -hmm. business related courses that that are doing fine. But if you're not going to put it, you're all into Skillshare, lower your expectations. But at the right. end of the day, just why not put them on there? Now, in a, in a situation like mine where I have over 40 courses, would you trickle them out like maybe two courses a month? Or what would, you, what would be your schedule for something like that? Yeah. I mean, if you don't, do you not have any courses on Skillshare? No, I have the, the beginnings of one like that I did like two years ago. <laughs> man, Dave. Oh, man. <laughs> That's that's a uh, all right. Kick me in the butt here. I mean, I need a, <laughs> yeah. a butt kick right here. <laughs> I'm just thinking that there there is definitely some lost opportunity there, and I think all right. with all these pro platforms, the length of time being on these platforms helps. So, mm. who knows what you could be doing now? Um, but I would put them out like a couple a month. Um, maybe since you have so many, maybe like putting out. Hey, even if you put out once one every week you would have enough mm -hmm. for almost a year's worth of courses that's or, true is that right yeah about okay. a year's um and see how it goes the one thing that has changed is that for a while skill everyone was putting together like short 15 minute bite-sized courses but because we're getting paid by minute I think the bigger courses work better on skillshare so don't break them up into separate courses i would put them all as basically the same as how you have them on on Udemy with um, great all together. All right. Well, you know, you're you're such a mellow guy that even I felt the butt kicking through. The <laughs> mouth, so quiet, calm. You know, <laughs> Dave, you're losing money. <laughs> yeah, that's that's as intense as I can get. <laughs> <laughs> that was very nice. Thank you. But I do feel a little butt kick, so that's good. Okay. Good. <laughs> Uh, on a different topic, we had a question from Max uh, directed at me about putting together a premium course. And I think f you can answer this too. He was asking if it was worth it. And I think uh, we'll take it two ways. Is it worth it for the student to take my premium course, my online course, master's course? And is it <laughs> worth it for me to put together that course? Um, well, for one thing, I definitely hope it's worth it for the students. And I think the way that I promote and pitch that course and I think with most premium courses, you kind of have to pitch it this way is that it's about there's a lot more hand holding involved and it's about like the benefit that you're going to help them achieve. A lot of what people I teach in this class, people can find for free. People might already know a lot what I teach in the online course masters premium class, but it's the resources that I've added that are exclusive to the premium course that I think separate it from for example, the course that's on Udemy or other other trainings or the podcast. Uh, so there's like worksheets, uh, checklists, there's an email sequence that you get. So every week you're getting reminded to do certain tasks. You get the, if you want, you get to Skype with me. That's one of the bonuses that I get. And someone asked if people have taken me up on that. And to be honest, not that many people have actually taken me up on the 30 minute Skype call. And I was a little hesitant to do that. And people were saying, oh, Phil, you shouldn't add that because you're going to be spending too much time. It's not worth it. But I, I don't know if people are just nervous, if people are just busy, but people haven't really taken me up on doing the, the Skype call, even though it's totally available um, for them. 
I'm giving out, you know, t-shirt to people who enroll, you know, little bonuses like that, that make it a little special. Uh, but anyway, so I hope it's worth it for the student in terms of, for me, it's, it's definitely been worth it because I feel like the online course masters program that I've put out is sort of the, the end all be all that I can put out for online teachers. And it's the best thing that I've put out. And it was a lot of work. I don't think I've been paid back for the amount of time and effort that I put into it right now, but now it's there. It's there for people who come to the website and want that more premium option. And I did a couple of webinars and they did okay. The first one was really good, made a bunch of sales, but that was to like a very warm audience that I already had. The second was to through Facebook ads and that was okay. Um, but I also just made an organic sale, just like totally organic. Someone signed up just from either taking the free trial or just finding it. And uh, that is just so awesome to see. It's like, it, and that's, that's where I'm at with it right now. I could, and maybe I should go full force doing webinars and the sales funnel, but that takes a lot, a lot of effort and time and energy. And, and it's also not really the way that I enjoy selling my products. And that's what I've, I've learned about myself. And so I'm still wondering if I'm going to do that, that whole like ad funnel with the webinar thing, or if I'm just going to have it there available for people, but just kind of not be like hard selling all the time. Yeah, when it comes to the webinar funnel, there is a there's a proven way to do it, and then there's every other way. And let me tell you, I've done every other way. <laughs> I'm I'm ready to do the proven way, and the proven way is in. The, let's see if I have the book here, the Expert Secrets book by Russell Brunson. Mm -hmm. uh, this book is amazing, um, and basically what Russell has done, he's done I don't know hundreds of seminars and webinars, and has kind of dialed in and refined. The webinar process and I think that's the way to sell one of those comprehensive courses like that is to do it through a webinar but there's a there's a format to the webinar the format I used to follow that would only make me a few sales was I would teach 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 all this good stuff mm -hmm. and then at the end people would feel like oh I got all I needed and they wouldn't feel like they needed to buy mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. format if, if I were to paraphrase what Russell says is Teach them how their life will change as a result of buying your webinar or buying your comprehensive course. So the process, the webinar process is not a process of selling them. Mm -hmm. It's actually a process of, of shifting their mindset to understand the benefits that they're going to get. So that when you finally do get to the part where you're, you're actually selling the, the, the comprehensive course, you've knocked down all the possible objections along the way, but you've done it in a way that was still, teaching uh, that mm -hmm. still gave them value, mm -hmm. you know, because changing somebody's mindset is giving value. If I change somebody's mindset from a poverty consciousness to a wealth consciousness, I've given them a tremendous amount of value. You know, mm -hmm. if, if I change somebody's mindset from not posting their courses on Skillshare to posting their courses on Skillshare, like Phil just did, mm -hmm. that changes my, my life. If I go and do that, which I will now one a week, at least, um, who knows how much more income that could be? It could be another, who knows, 10 or 15,000 a year in additional income that I didn't have, but Phil helped to change my mindset. So, so anyway, all that to say is that there's an art and science to webinars, uh, to doing them right and ethically, because you're, you're not just wanting to pitch like, you know, yeah. infomercial, you're, you're wanting to really help people and change lives through your teaching. Yeah. Uh, I, I, frankly, I don't want people in a higher ticket program of mine if they're not the right people meaning if they're not going to benefit from it if they're not going to get their money's worth you know i'm going to charge 997 for a comprehensive course coming up pretty soon and i want to eliminate the people that it won't benefit because mm -hmm. i'd rather they not spend 997 bucks with me if it's not going to help them and if they're not of the right mindset mm -hmm. for it to work for them you know so I think that's we owe that to our customers and our prospects. You know, we owe them that we're not here just to take your money. We're here to really help you. Yeah, no, so true. So yeah, it's been a great experiment, and I would love to 
eventually put together another premium course on more like photography or video production, that kind of thing, uh, just to see if that would work. But to be honest, right now, mm -hmm. Udemy is working so well. It's continued to work so well this year that I'm still focused on that and just creating more courses that I'm going to put on, on Udemy um, for the rest of the year. And I, Udemy Live is going to be exciting this year just to see how it goes. Last year, I feel like I was heading into Udemy Live a little bit not as excited as I am this year about Udemy. And last year, it really changed my mindset. And I was like, okay, back to Udemy. Let's start doing Udemy courses again. <laughs> I'm already at that point right now. So I'm just interested to see what what they have to say. And it's just a good weekend anyways, just to meet people and hang out with everyone. So we'll yeah, see. it should be it should be good also to meet the new CEO and the mm -hmm. new director of uh, I forget what position he's in, Pro um, content or something content, like that. Yeah, yeah. content. Yeah, uh, that that would be interesting. And also specifically, I want to hear what the new CEO has planned and how they're going to change things because mm -hmm. uh, I believe that Udemy has far greater potential than it has experienced so far, mm -hmm. and I believe that it has nowhere to go but up. And uh, I I sense from the the fact that this person coming in is from an e-commerce background and has grown companies in the past. In other words, think of him as a growth specialist. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting when you study business, there are levels at which you can grow. And if and at some point your business can outgrow you and your ability to run it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's what happened. But uh, if you bring in somebody who has already had a track record of growing companies in the past, you know, there's good and bad to that, too, though. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes growth comes at the expense of the creator or the instructor and whatnot. So as long as they can keep both sides happy. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. And it'll be really interesting to see what, what the CEO has to say. So yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah. uh, like you said, I think there's a ton of potential for growth still. I mean, if they do it right and they continue to do it right, there's no reason why they should uh, stop growing anytime soon. Absolutely. So we have a few questions, uh, a bunch of questions. So thank you everyone for posting your questions that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, one was, let's get to, oh, this is a cool one. What do you think about putting a course on YouTube as a playlist? We are going to launch one of our older courses and market it to test it. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. It might be. It might be a great way to just introduce you to a new audience, I would consider maybe putting out like a free course that you have as a playlist on YouTube, but also um, maybe in all of those videos, tell people, hey, if you want a better learning experience, join the free course on my, my own site, just so you could get that viewer onto your own email list um, eventually. Yeah, or at the end of each of the videos, each of the individual videos, you have a call to action to a more advanced course. Mm -hmm. on Udemy or on your own self-hosted platform. Um, in and of itself, having a, a course as a playlist is not going to do a lot for you yeah. financially unless you use it as a lead generator to drive traffic to a more advanced course. Or, or if you can build an email list from it, that would be very valuable as well. Yeah. So one of those two, either send them to, an, to one of your paid courses or send them to an opt-in form to get them on an email list. Those would be good things for that. Yeah. If you're trying to grow your YouTube channel though, playlists are a great way to do that because YouTube looks at all kinds of things, but watch time, but also what do people do after they watch your video to determine the ranking of your, your video. So if there's a lot of people going from one of your videos to another of your videos, YouTube's going to see that and that's going to increase your ranking. So that's one way to help your own um, YouTube channel. So that question was from uh, Joel and Natalie who were on the podcast. So thanks for that question. They also had another qu quick question about, have you ever marketed Amazon Video Direct? And then they had also asked about Skillshare. And to be honest, I'm not promoting or marketing those sources because I can do better and make more money promoting courses on my own site or just through my Udemy courses. So I don't want to tr drive traffic to those other platforms because it's not really that worth it when there's another option uh there oh thomas george has another great question about he's co-instructing his first course on udemy do you guys have any advice or tips for co-instructing 
Dave? Uh, not that I can think of, really. I mean, I've, I've co-instructed a few courses on Udemy, mostly with friends. Um, yeah. I don't really go out of my way to co-instruct. Um, for example, I have a friend who had a credit repair slash debt, how to get out of debt course, and I co-instructed that with him. I had another friend that had a course about how to uh, how to do a good resume for getting a job. And so these are just friends that I happen to know that are experts in what they do. And I say, hey, we should do a course together. And it's really easy to do. Um, as far as advice, I guess, uh, you know, the cool thing about Udemy is they make it easy because they make it so you can automatically split the, the sales and Udemy pays out to each individual separately. So mm -hmm. there's no there's no issues as far as money or anything like that. You just decide on the split that you want, the percentage that you want, and you set, you set that up. But yeah. um, I would just keep in mind, um, I mean, if it's even, even if it's a friend, um, ha knowing your expectations up front, I've co-instructed a few courses where you know, the expectation was to, for that other instructor to be answering questions and to be involved after the fact. But, you know, that instructor disappeared after we launched the course. And as we know, there's a lot of work that happens after the course is launched. So if that's the case, and if they don't want to be a part of answering questions or doing any sort of promotions or updates later on, you know, have that set in stone and maybe there's a revenue change or something um, because of that. Um, and yeah, that's like one of my biggest things. Um, I think what I've learned is make sure that you're co-creating classes that are on brand with your current niche. There's some people who do really well and make a lot of money at just creating a ton of classes on all kinds of topics. And I'm one to sit, you know, I'm one to talk because it, I do have a lot of classes on all kinds of topics, but I hope that they're, they, I have different audiences within my brand and I, I'm not going to teach like a programming course on, on Python because no one in my audience is remotely related to that. All right. None of my courses are remotely related to that. So I think co-teaching courses that you, your current students are going to be interested in is, is a good idea to do. Um, having a plan so that what are you going to do with it? Outside of Udemy, like Dave mentioned, it's super easy to split revenue on Udemy, but off of Udemy, can you post it on your own websites? Can you post it on Skillshare? Like who's going to be in charge of splitting revenue or is there going to be a split of revenue off on those other platforms? Those are just some questions that I've I've uh, ran into myself. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much all I could think of right now. Um there was another question. Oh, Max asked about what do we think about Udemy accepting Payoneer as the new uh, payment processing? Um, I don't, you know, I saw that pop up, but um, do you have any thoughts on that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I really don't have any thoughts on it. You know, I, I've, I've seen in some of the forums how people talk about, oh, this is going to bring in a lot of people who previously could not accept PayPal. Um, and the, the insinuation was it's going to lower the quality of courses on Udemy and therefore it's going to lower how people see Udemy and that kind of thing. I think Udemy is much bigger than that. And I think that the world is bigger than that. And uh, and it's also kind of making a big assumption that uh, people in, in countries where opportunities aren't as big uh, are going to create poor content. That's not necessarily true. They might create amazing content. So yeah. Um, it's too many assumptions, in my opinion, to to really go with. So I think it opens it up to more instructors, and I think that's a good thing uh, because I'm, you and I, Phil, we're, we we love online teaching, and we want everybody, you know, that can do it to do it. You know, we we we, I think we come from an abundance mindset. There's plenty of room for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, Udemy is tiny compared to where it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be huge. It's going to be massive. And if you're concerned about competition right now, <laughs> watch out because yeah. it's going to be it's going to be more. But again, we have to have an abundance mentality. I believe that there's so much to go around. There's, you know, we haven't even tapped a percentage of all the university education that exists out in the world. Yeah, with online courses. So there's there's huge abundance and huge opportunity. 
that you know we have to be careful not to close our minds too much and think oh this is all there is and i want my peace for myself and stay away from, you know that's a that's a dangerous mentality in my opinion yeah i think as long as you i it's not it's kind of like a you stick your head in the sand mentality but just like put out your best content and just keep keep doing that and stop worrying about the competition in that terms of, in yeah. that in that sense i one thing that i talk about on a webinar that i've done is that udemy i think up until now has like 0.1 percent of the world's population or something like that um in courses and so <laughs> imagine and they've created millionaires and that's that's not me but and so that's saying something for being a pretty successful person on udemy but they've created people that t instructors who have made a lot more money than i have and and many many more who are just you know doing it full time or doing it part time so imagine what will happen if they capture just one percent of the world's population you know there's so much room to expand and that's exciting yeah. to me and not to mention if again how easy it is for a big company that already has a huge audience even something like facebook to go hey we're going to get into online teaching because we believe the world will be a better place if you know this is a whole silicon valley we want to make the world a better place right and yeah. not that that's bad but but anyway if that were the theoretical situation and they said facebook said we're launching a new initiative you know facebook education blah 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 watch out there's two billion people on Facebook. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like I said, it's a no brainer to do this for any company to do this. They have the resources to to sell digital information. The, the overhead costs, the cost of developing a team so small compared to the, the profit that's available uh, that I would not be surprised if we had like a almost like an online education bubble, you know, a bunch of companies coming in, a bunch of companies getting swished out and some of the ones surviving and and yeah. growing. I would not be surprised if that happens. Yeah, it seems like that hasn't I, I was worried or I was wondering if that was happening like the past couple of years, but it just doesn't seem like we've even gotten to that point yet. So yeah, we're too early. Yeah, which is good. Yeah, it's a great time to be here. Uh, maybe we'll take just one more question. If you guys have any last minute questions, let us know. But uh, we hope that you found a lot of value in this. Max asks, how do you funnel students to your own list, educational announcements to your blog, but actually do not sell anything right away, but then having an opt-in form there? I think that's an example. And I mean, that's pretty much what I'm doing. I, I am... I try to send out educational announcements as often as possible. That's one area where I'm not as good at anymore just because I have so many classes. But when I do, I, I'm trying to start a new schedule where every week I'm writing a super high quality blog article. And so if whenever I do that, I'm going to try to send that to the students that might be interested in that in those courses. So, I mean, that's really the one way that I'm doing it. Um, I'm creating a lot of just content on YouTube and on my website that people are finding me outside of Udemy. I think that's where most of my traffic comes from. I, to be honest, I could do a lot more with getting people from Udemy onto my own website. Yeah, and, and we all could. And at the same time, because it's hard to track that, how, how many of those people are actually getting into our web, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's more of a, like a long-term thing where we just do what we can when we can, mm -hmm. um, you know, and work it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. I was, um, again, chatting with this guy, Chris Dutton, who teaches, uh, Microsoft Excel classes today for the online course master show. And he, he has it down to a science. I mean, he, every month he's sending out a welcome message to using the educational announcements, a welcome message to people who enrolled in the past like 60 days, but hasn't started the class. And then halfway oh, wow. through the month, he's sending a message asking for reviews and asking how he can be more helpful to like a separate sec section of people. And then at the end of the month, he does his promotional messages. But he just got me thinking like, I could be doing a lot more with my educational announcements on Udemy. Yeah, so. All right. I hate this guy already. <laughs> he, he, he was so it was so interesting talking to him because he's he teaches Excel. So he's very analytical and it's just like he's right. got it down to a science. And methodical. Yep. Methodical. Yeah. That's I, 
that's how he thinks. It's so yeah. funny because I don't, I don't think that way. I was like, it would be awesome if I did think that way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. I, I, I mean, same here. I'm just like, oh, today I'm going to write an article about this and maybe I'll send it to <laughs> people on Udemy, but yeah. Yeah, that's great. It's great though. If somebody were to set up, like if he were to set up a course that said, you know, here's what you follow and I'll set, I'll even set up an Excel calendar for you if that exists or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and it's a template that's worked for me. And I mean, that would be valuable for instructors, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. Or a service that does it for you and even better, they just sign, you know, they're just managing <laughs> all of our accounts. Yeah, there you go, man. Crazy. Yeah, we well, did, we did that. <laughs> Man, this has been good, and uh, we'll see each other at Udemy Live in a couple weeks, right? Absolutely. Or next yeah. weekend. Man, that's coming up. Two weeks, yeah, because this coming weekend, I'm driving, uh, my family and I are driving to L.A. to meet family. Well, not L.A., Orange County, to hang out and visit, so that will be cool. And yeah. then the following week, we'll be at Udemy Live. Um, hey, I wanted to mention something before we go. Yep. Um, my most recent educational announcement was interesting because... I swear, I got so many people buying multiples of my courses. Mm -hmm. uh, mul bunch of people buying four courses, five courses, three courses at a time. Uh, it was way more than usual. And so I'm thinking about doing like either a webinar or, or even a, a very inexpensive course, analyzing each of those announcements that I sent, because I sent three announcements to three different segments. Mm -hmm. um, my e-commerce students, my online learn, uh, my online teaching students and my digital marketing students. But in each one of those categories, I got multiples of sales. And which, this is a promotional announcement, right? Yeah, promotional announcement. Did I say educational? I think you did. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah, promotional announcement. And um, so what I'd like to do is just analyze the sales copy in each promotional announcement. Mm -hmm. And how or why did I get this result? Because it's unusual. And I made more money than I have in a long time with my promotional announcements because people bought three, four, five, six of my courses. Basically, if I recommended, I re probably recommended five or six courses in each email. Mm -hmm. So some people bought them all. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, well, that's it awesome. was crazy. Yeah. So I've been, I thought I'd float it out to you and maybe even to our audience to see if they'd be interested in, in something like that. Because I haven't done it yet. I just know that the result happened. Yeah. And I could just go and now almost subjectively look at it and go, well, here's what I did here. Here's how I described this course. Because I did do some things differently in the descriptions of each course. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, I think it could be valuable for people. So, well, yeah, it's totally sounds like it. I mean, I don't, there's so much that we could do. And I wish we had more it was easier to do, but segmenting our audience, split testing subject lines and, and yeah, just all kinds of stuff. And we could do a lot of it actually ourselves. It just takes a lot more work than sending the same announcement to everyone. Um, but I don't yeah. really know that many people who are kind of looking that deep into those kinds of things. So I'm sure that would be interested and I'll, I'll, you know, maybe I'll do some experiments myself and just, even even as simply as just segmenting my audience and sending a right. different announcement with a different subject line just to see how they do. So, yeah. Yeah, it definitely could be valuable. Um, it, it helped when I started doing that. Instead of sending one blanket promotional email to all 45 courses, uh, I segmented it into those three main categories that I teach in. Mm -hmm. Super helpful because they know they're getting something that's that's just for them. Yeah, totally. Um, Cool. Uh, just a really quick follow up. Max uh, Cordero was following up about um, Udemy allowing opt ins on your blog if you're sending people to it as an educational announcement. Um, if the rules are still the same, you can still have an opt in like in the sidebar, but you can't, it can't be like obvious that you're, and it can't be the reason why you're sending people to your site can't just be like here's a blog article and here's a big opt-in box at the top of the page am i right i mean we're still allowed to send yeah. it and if there's like a little opt-in in the sidebar that's fine even sometimes yep. i get a little worried about about that but and it might be better just to double check with policy every time you send an educational announcement because you don't want to get docked but it's um 
I don't think it's against the rules to have an opt-in. It's just the content, uh, the main thing that you're sending and the majority of it has to be educational. Yep, that's true. That's the way it should be. And and to be safe, I would just have it a, a small sidebar opt-in. Yeah. And then I wouldn't even make the content of that opt-in form too promotional or hypey or whatever. Yeah. Make it something yeah. simple. Something obviously something people will, will want, but something that'll be a standard part of every page on your site should be okay. Yeah, totally. Cool, Dave. Well, everyone, hopefully you enjoyed this live show. Uh, of course, uh, we always say we'll try to do these more often, but uh, we'll get to it maybe in the next month or two, maybe do a recap show after Udemy Live. That might be a good idea. Um, yep. And keep asking your questions on the Passive Income Show, and uh, we're always here to help. So thanks for being here with us today. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Okay. Have a great rest of your week, guys, and everyone, and girls, and everyone who's going to Udemy Live. We'll see you there. Bye. See you there. Bye, Dave. Bye-bye.